blanket. The hard, rough boards of the ship were rubbing his bones. He had never been this sick in his life. <laughs> I've been on a boat before and was terribly sick. I think my parents were on it too. <laughs> his stomach churned and waves of nausea threatened to rise higher in his throat. The world seemed full of despair and blackness as he thought back to when he told his parents goodbye. In his mind, he could still see his mother in tears. I plan to come back to you in four years. I will be 30 then, Francis had told them with his voice breaking. No, his father had quavered with tears running down his cheeks. I will never see my boy again. Would he return to England safely? What was he doing going to the colonies? It was not for honor or money. No, he was going to the end of the earth to live for God and to bring others to do so also. After seven weeks, on October 27, 1771, the ship finally made it to Philadelphia. Francis arrived without a penny to his name, but with great confidence in the Methodist doctrine of holiness for whosoever. The Methodist St. George's Church of Philadelphia was impressive. <clears throat> Captain Webb, the French and Indian War hero, had helped get it started. Wherever he had preached, people flocked to hear him. He had lost an eye in a battle along with George Washington, but the one remaining eye would flash fire. He made quite a sensation as he would preach in his old war uniform with his open sword on the pulpit. Francis was inspired by the story of Captain Webb, but upset by other things he saw in the American colonies. While attending the meetings in Philadelphia and New York, he realized that the discipline was loose. He watched women with fancy, expensive dresses strut into class meetings. Their dresses were not modest enough, and their huge hats were adorned with feathers. <laughs> the people would talk on and on with each other about silly, foolish things as they laughed and joked. This troubled Francis. He did not believe in half-hearted Methodists who were not strict in praying, reading their Bible, and how they acted. Not just everyone should be let into the class meetings, he reasoned. We Methodists believe in holiness. Let everyone come to the preaching, but the class meetings are for those who are carefully trying to live after God's pattern. But, Brother Asbury, Brother Pilmore complained, if you speak out, you will run the people off. We will have a holy people or none, Francis answered. Francis did not travel 3,000 miles and leave his home to play church. He was determined to see people's lives and actions changed by the message of God's holiness. Another thing that disturbed Francis was how little traveling that the preachers around these cities were doing. He was used to the Methodists who took the gospel to the farms and villages. Francis immediately started traveling around to the communities telling everyone who would listen that they could be saved. There was a hell and they needed to repent and believe and love one another. Francis' lips moved in prayer as his horse clip-clopped down the road. His body ached and his head felt like it was on fire. He had a fever, again. He had only been in America a few weeks as he trotted up and down little roads, really some no more than horse trails, to reach everyone he could. He felt like he needed to lead the way and show the preachers how to ride circuits. He told himself, I will be faithful to God, to the people, and to my own soul. Depression settled like a black cloud over his sick head. You are not even a great preacher, he told himself. He remembered trying to preach on the ship coming over. He had leaned against the mizen mast and talked to those around him. The sailors had glanced at him, unfazed by his words, and walked on. I'm not a wonderful preacher, but I can ride circuits, Francis answered himself, and ride he would. He got so sick that winter that he thought he was going to die. But as soon as he was able, he was back on the trail. <clears throat> After one year, an amazing letter reached Francis from John Wesley. Mr. Wesley had made him his assistant. Thoughts swarmed through Francis's head. Now he was in charge of his, his American group. In his mind, he could see dozens of preachers on horses going up and down the American coast starting Methodist meetings everywhere, praying with the people and helping them get saved. Then a thought hit him like a ton of bricks. 
Oh, oh, the responsibility of being over the American Methodist. It was a heavy load. His mind went to some of the preachers here in the colonies, like Robert Strawbridge, who did things their own way. This could divide the whole group. The Methodists were just a part of the Anglicans or the Church of England. Only ordained ministers could baptize and serve communion, and yet Strawbridge and a few others in the South did this. Could Francis bring all the sides together? Hmm. As Francis's horse splashed through the creeks and rode through the forest, he carried this load. He was praying, praying that he could talk to his preachers and bridge the gap. He rode the many miles to the northern and southern conference meetings trying to keep peace. Sometimes he stayed upright on his horse by his sure will. He rode on and on, even with fevers, colds, coughing fits, and swollen glands. He prayed, sweated, worked, and talked to the people. Sometimes he would be offered a nice room to stay in. Whether he slept in a farmer's cabin or out on the ground, he would toss and turn, sleeping the best he could. In the morning, he would get back on his horse, whether his stomach was upset, his throat was sore, or his ulcers were bothering him again. Mm. Brother Asbury, a letter has come for you. Francis looked up to see the envelope from England. It was his mother's handwriting. Oh, how he missed her. Eagerly, he opened the letter. As he began to read, his heart sank. His mother was pleading for him to come home. She was not doing well and felt she needed her only son. Francis sat down and took out his quill pen to write her back. How could he leave when he had only been there for a year? Dear mother, I cannot leave the work God has called me to for the dearest friend in life. Francis thought his first duty was to his heavenly father. Such homesickness welled up in Francis, but he would never see his mother, father, or his own home again. As Francis was absorbed in his responsibility, others in the colonies were absorbed in the taxes England's parliament put on them. Francis could sense a storm brewing all around as the American colonists were taking sides both for or against England and King George III. A few Americans, the Patriots, were even calling for separation from England while the Tories, or Loyalists, wanted to stay with King George. Francis shivered. If war came, what would happen to the Church of England and the Methodists who were part of the Church of England? He could sense some of the patriots eyeing him with suspicion. Francis had been so engrossed in his thoughts that he was startled to hear someone yelling. He looked around in confusion to find what was going on. There at the side of the road was an old man shrieking and cussing. Suddenly Francis realized, he's cussing at me. Then he saw the stones in the man's hand. Take that! the man called out. Rocks were flying around him. Francis dug his heels into the sides of his horse and clung to his neck as, neck as he galloped away. He probably thinks I'm a Tory. And we'll stop there.